Hello, welcome to episode 74 of our weekly Cricket Hair vodcast. As you might be able to tell um, from the gasworks in the background, we're here at the Oval. Um, so well, by the time you're watching this, today's match will have already been played and that's going to be between Oval Invincibles and London Spirit. Um, and there are a number of um, possible um, outcomes of today's game. Sid, do you want to talk us through what today's game could mean for the table? Uh, well, first outcome is it could get rained off pretty unlikely looking at the sky um, so there's, there'll almost certainly be a result today unless of course it's a it's a, it's a tie of course um, so what could happen well if the Oval Invincibles win today especially if they win well they'll put themselves in a very very strong position they've already got the best net run rate of the chasing pack um, and if they win today then um, anyone else would need a net run rate advantage to kind of overtake them um, that's going to be difficult to close down so they'll put themselves in a very strong position to uh, potentially even lose their last game and still go through. Uh, Spirit very much need to win their last two games. Um, they need a win today and to guarantee going through they'll need a win in the next game as well. If they don't win today it's still technically possible that they could get through but that would have to be on net run rate and their net run rate is currently quite poor. So that's where we are at the moment. Okay great. Um so hopefully looking forward to a good game of cricket today. Um, earlier this week we already saw um, that to nobody's surprise, least of all yours Sid, Southern Brave have now um, become the first team to qualify, um, not just for the eliminator but they will finish top um, so they have definitely gone straight through to the final um, and they did so in, in quite convincing fashion in the end didn't they Sid? Yeah it was absolutely emphatic wasn't it, it was a real statement you know um, and they, they, they've been playing well throughout, but they just came out and it was the, the batting in particular was on another level, I think. Um, and, you know, Danny Wyatt made another 50 uh, and Smriti Mandana made 70 something um, and was obviously their key player that day. And straight through to the final they are and, you know, looking like deserved champions already, really. Um, but of course, Smriti, highest scorer, she's going home, Raf. Um, is this, you know, is this the end of the road for the Southern Brave? I nearly said Vipers there. <laughs> is it the end of the road? Um, I think that, um, that that's a bit of a pessimistic way to look at things. Um, it's not to say that that's not to say that they won't miss her, obviously. Um, as you say, she did play a big role in that particular game. But overall, I think she's only their third highest run scorer in the competition, behind Danny Wyatt and Sophia Dunkley. Um, and I think one of the strengths that we've seen that Brave have displayed has been a real depth. Um, particularly to their batting um, with people like uh, Maya Boucher for example able to come in um, and and um, you know play a, a strong role for Brave really. Um, in terms of the actual lineup of the batting they're obviously going to have to rejig things a bit because Smriti was one of the openers um, but Maya Boucher who I've just mentioned opens in county cricket so it's possible that we might see her at the top of the order and she certainly um, earned it. Um, they are also bringing in an injury or not an injury but they are bringing in a replacement for Smriti. Um, Gabby Lewis of Ireland is coming in um, which is obviously a good thing um, for, for Irish cricket I suppose. Um, do you think we're likely to see her in the in the last kind of group game and and the final, Sid? Uh, yeah, they maybe they, they might play her in the group game. Uh, she might also play in the final, I guess. Um, I think it might depend on whether she does well in the group game potentially. Um, they, you know, they have got a lot of options, as you said. They could even potentially move Dunks up to open um, if they want to keep Maya down the order a bit. Um, and also they've got Paige Schofield who hasn't played any part in it yet. Um, we're not aware that she's injured or anything like that so she'll presumably be itching to get a go in that case um, so lots of options open to them it'll be interesting to see what they do in their final group game and that could then inform what happens in the final right so um, now looking at more at the 100 overall Raf um, you wrote a piece for the Guardian this week go and read it go, no no hang on no, don't, don't go and read it now read it in a minute come, come, come back come back come back come back read it in a minute after this video Good, thanks. Okay, so um, yeah, you wrote a bit for the, about the 100 for The Guardian. Uh, you also spoke to Beth Barrett-Wild uh, for that piece. Uh, she's the head of the Women's 100, just to remind everyone. Um, the 100 Women's Competition. Sorry. Sorry, Beth. Um, <laughs> She, she, she's the, the, the head of the 100 women's competition and um, she said she had lots to say that didn't make it into the piece because you know you only had a few hundred words to play with. Uh, what did she have to say Raf that wasn't in the piece? What interesting stuff have you learned? 
Yeah, I think there were a few um, points. One of the things that she talked about was potentially the fact that actually the 100 being delayed by a year because of COVID is maybe a bit of a, a blessing in disguise in terms of the, the depth of performances that we're seeing from domestic players um, who have obviously had um, almost a year of the, the new regional structure to kind of bed down um, and actually prepare them to play on a big stage in front of a big crowd like the 100. I mean, nothing can necessarily prepare them for playing, um, you know, in at these, um, you know, in front of these big crowds. Um, but it was still an interesting point actually and I know that one of the things we talked about before the tournament was being slightly concerned that for some of the younger domestic players um, who really aren't used to kind of playing with lots of attention and lots of eyes on them it could be a little bit scary um, and potentially quite scarring to kind of come on and maybe um, bowl um, a five or, or you know a ten um, not an over uh, which I nearly said, and um, you know, then be tonked for a lot of runs. Um, but we haven't really seen that. Um, you know, we, what we've actually seen is some really strong performances from from domestic players um, who um, you know haven't, who are still quite young. So somebody like Alice Capsey um, or even Maya Boucher or, or Danny Gibson for the Spirit um, have all kind of put in really um, good performances um, and really showcased what they can do. And I, I think that was quite an interesting point made by Beth. Yeah, definitely. I think that, that we were, everyone in the game was a little bit concerned that, especially without the, the big hitting Australians, that we could be seeing at much lower kind of par scores and things. And we just haven't seen that. You know, we've we've generally seen teams, almost almost every match has seen teams, both teams, make run rates well above 100. So, you know, and we, we've got an average score in the competition of something like 125. So that the runs are really coming. And that's, that's, that's great news and kind of allays our fears, I think. Um, one thing that we've seen, you know, more traditionally in junior cricket in this country which has had an impact on county cricket and you know later on the KSL and things is that junior girls in this country for a long time have been taught to value their wicket above all else so they've been taught that if they, if they get out that's when their coach will have a go at them um, you know and what they need to do is protect their wicket and then if they can make runs on top of that that's a good thing now this contrasts uh, very much with the way that they approach girls cricket in Australia and pro probably junior cricket for the boys as well for all I know um, is that you know, there they're looking at how many runs you can make how fast you can score um, and the, you know they, it's much more a permission to get out as long as you score quick runs and you, and you score big runs so the impact that's had in county cricket over you know quite a long period of time has been you know generally that that's why in the, the women's county championship you got maximum bonus points for scoring at four and over you know so what we were concerned, I think, is that we'd see that kind of scoring coming from those domestic players, a more sort of fearful approach. But that's not what we've seen at all. We've seen a fearless approach. And that's because the approach to, cho to coaching has changed and become more, more Australian-like over the last sort of seven, ten years. And you're seeing that in players like Alice Capsey that are coming through. But that's also had an impact upon the older players, upon you know the players like Eve Jones, who's pushing 30 but is scoring at a higher rate now than she ever was you know, previously in her career. So I think that that's been fantastic to see. And I think that that's going to where things like the 100 are actually going to really help to bring us closer to the Australians and to provide more of a challenge to the Australians in the women's ashes over the next 10 years. So I think it's been really exciting like that. Great. Um, one of the other points that, that Beth uh, made in our interview was... Um, kind of clarifying the interaction between the squads um, there's been quite a lot of talk about this um, and what Beth was able to say was that um, it's not what they hoped it would be um, because of Covid that's meant that the men's and the women's teams have had to be much more separate than they were hoping so for example Beth talked about a vision whereby the men and the women would travel together to the ground and travel back to the hotel on the same buses for example um, and actually be able to foster that more um, kind of informal social interaction um, that could could potentially um, be quite be quite uh, revolutionary for English cricket because we haven't really seen that before. But she did say um, that there has been um, kind of what I think is probably still an unprecedented level of interaction um, with some of the teams. So, for example. Um, the example that she gave was speaking to Charlotte Edwards, coach of the Women's Southern Brave team, um, has actually been um, consulted very frequently uh, by the coach of the men's team, Mahela Jai Wardner, um, who will come up, kind of come up to her when the women's game finishes and say, look, um, Lossie, you've just played on this pitch. What's it doing? What tactics should, be, should we be using? Um, so that's quite an interesting example. I don't know to what extent that's happening across all of the teams, um, but it's certainly 
um, according to Beth, is happening at, at Southern Brave. Um, not something that we've really seen in English cricket before, whereby men's and women's cricket has really been quite separate. Um, so I think that's interesting. And potentially she talks about that being a platform for more interaction, more kind of genuine interaction between the actual players next year, when hopefully the COVID restrictions um, will be a little less severe. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, and then I know a lot of kind of talk in the interview about what this means for women's cricket going forward, but particularly um, they're going to do this big post-tournament review. Think about some of these difficult questions, things that we've raised in the vodcast um, about, um, say, for example, um, crowds. Uh, there's been a little bit of tension. Is it a family-friendly tournament? Is it um, a tournament for your traditional blast crowds who just want to come along and have six beers um, in the space of half an hour? Um, and they, she kind of admitted that, that maybe they haven't quite got that right this year, but they are thinking about things like family stands, um, alcohol-free zones, um, and those kind of things. So that's that's being very much reviewed. Um, there's a question, obviously quite another big question about um, given that the double headers were a kind of um, a COVID necessity, will we keep that next year? And I think that that is a big question, actually. Um, and Beth seems, from what she said, very keen to keep those for next year. She said that the players themselves really value that match day experience at the big grounds um, whereby they kind of come out through the 100 tunnel um, and they have all of the fireworks and all of those, you know, just those added additions on the day that you wouldn't get for example if you were playing a hundred match at Sedba school I don't think I think that's quite unlikely on the other hand um, you know there's a little bit of tension there with what some of the smaller counties were promised isn't there Sid yeah because places like Taunton um, you know they, they obviously wanted to appease places like Taunton and Chelmsford that hadn't got the franchises uh, for the, the hundred for essentially for the men's competition and they said well it's okay guys because you can have you know the women's competition and so we were expecting uh, at Hove um, for the, the Southern Brave to play at Hove and that to be their headquarters for the women. Uh, Chelmsford where the, um, the London Spirit will be able to play um, and so on and so forth. Uh, Taunton as well for the, the uh, Western Welsh Stroke Welsh Fire, yeah. sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, obviously that paints another, that's another dilemma in itself and another question. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be tough to have to go to those counties and go, well, you know, we said you'd get those games. Well, actually, we're going to carry on with the double header thing. I think that that's going to um, be difficult politically because there's still a lot of pressure being put on the ECB to, you know, in terms of like what's this going to do to county cricket and the, the ECB is still having to be very defensive about how men's county cricket is impacted by this and anything else that further increases the gap between the hundred and the, the, the eight teams that have got hundred franchises because let's face it that's what they are um, and the, the, the rest of them in the men's game that haven't so yeah Okay, and then obviously um, something that's easy to forget, um, but is going to represent quite a significant um, scheduling challenge for the ECB next summer is the fact that England and Birmingham are hosting the Commonwealth Games, um, of which women's cricket is going to be making its first appearance. Um, so it's a really exciting, big opportunity for women's cricket, but um, it's being scheduled um, basically at the time that the 100 should be starting. Isn't that right, Sid? Yeah, so it's, it's at the end of July and the first uh, the first se section of August, first week in a bit of August um, and obviously the cricket competition you know they'll, they'll want to get the sides over here at least a week before that so you're talking about quite a, a large window when the England women aren't going to be available that's going to be another dilemma for them do they do they leave the England women out of the first section of the competition I mean we've seen we've just talked about how the domestic players have stepped up but if you take out another layer of the top players is that going to damage the competition particularly initially it's going to be an interesting dilemma for them um, who wants to be in Beth World shoes well and Beth Barrett World does but and the other big thing, um, of course, is that next year is meant to be, um, or people have said, oh, well, the Australians will be able to come and play next year. Well, they won't if they're playing in the Commonwealth Games. Anyway, um, so uh, Beth did kind of recognise that there are these challenges, but, you know, in a way, there's some exciting questions there. I think that um, the piece that I wrote was, was very positive, And to be honest, it was difficult to, to really write a negative piece given um, the incredible crowds that we've seen in this competition are just you know it's just difficult to believe isn't it that we are seeing an average of seven and a half thousand people turning up for women's domestic cricket we've not seen that in women's cricket here or anywhere in the world um, and we've not really seen that for women's women's sport in this country either any women's sport um, 
and that's just incredible. Yeah, no, it's important to recognise. I mean, obviously, if you're fr if, if you're from the FA, you're going to go, yeah, but these are double headers. Mm -hmm. If but if you're from the the ECB, you're going to go, hey, FA, these are bigger crowds than the Women's Super League is getting. Yeah. Um, so you know, even obviously, we're only counting. Don't forget the crowds for people that are through the gate before. Is it about a half hour cut off roughly before the women's game starts? So we're looking at, at people that were through the gate during the women's game, basically. Um, and you know, no, no, that's what you've just said. So it's halfway sorry. through. Yeah. Yes, through the halfway through the women's game. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So we're looking at the crowds that are, that are there for the women's game. We're not counting the crowds at the end of the men's game, which obviously are bigger. Um, and you know, that's a, a real challenge for um, you know someone like the FA to go. Well, you know, the cricket has changed the game a bit and has shown that you can have even larger crowds. So. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, but what I was going to say was that I wrote this positive piece, um, but I think that there are big challenges ahead. Um, and one of the things that we often see in women's cricket is we see these big moments. Um, for example, we see um, 85,000 people at the MCG in March 2020, but what happens afterwards? Um, obviously, in that instance, what happened afterwards was a Katy global... Perry concert? Oh, yeah. I was going to get a Katy Perry concert here, Raph. I was going to say what happened afterwards was a global pandemic, which nobody could really predict. Um, but, you know, it is about a kind of ongoing momentum, isn't it? And about translating some of these crowds there at the 100 and some of this interest in the 100 teams into the Rachel Hayhoe Flint Trophy, into the Charlotte Edwards Cup and into kind of England women matches as well. Um, so those are really important things to be thinking about. And the 100 isn't um, the kind of be all and end all, but it is still really exciting. Absolutely. Okay, um, I think that we'll wrap things up there. We need to get into the Oval and watch some cricket. Um, by the time you see this, we will know the outcome of today's Invincibles v Spirit match. Um, we're off on the holiday for a couple of days. Am I allowed to say that, Sid? Uh, I believe you just said it. Um, but we will be bringing you all the action, of course. Uh, we'll be back for the uh, Eliminator, which sounds a bit scary. And the, the Eliminator! <laughs> and the final next weekend. Um, and we'll be bringing you another broadcast, of course, next weekend. So see you then. Bye for now. Bye.